Make It Right, the manufacturing podcast. This is the Make It Right podcast. I'm Janet Eastman. And if you listened to our show last week, you'll know that my guest, Greg Orloff, is with the digital publication IIoT World, where he's the chief innovation officer. In his role, he explores what is happening in the industrial Internet of Things world. Now, last week, we talked about the opportunities and challenges of the connected industry, and we continue that conversation with more talk about security, sensors, and the human role in all of it. We pick up our conversation talking about industry adoption of technology. I was talking to um, a fellow a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he had a really interesting take on on where the future is is going with manufacturing and and just basically technology in the future itself. But specifically, when he was talking about manufacturing, he just said, you know, think about what the manufacturers were like back uh, in the days of steam. When electricity came along, there were some were saying, "Oh, we don't need electricity. You know, we'll be fine using steam." Well, there's no factories or anything operating out there that aren't using electricity now, right? Like you all, everybody had to get on board, or you were sunk, right? So right. he is saying that we cannot be manufacturers now and ignore the technological opportunities, things like AI and and big data and whatever, now because we'll be shutting our doors because there aren't any companies out there operating without electricity now. You have to have it, and you're going to need these technologies to move forward in the future. Uh, The only only exception I would take is I don't think that you have to have an all-encompassing massive adoption out of the gate. Okay. It's, you know, the... There were probably savvy buggy whip manufacturers back in the thrilling days of yesteryear that, that saw the writing on the wall, jumped out, and uh, and started making uh, the equivalent of a riding crop for a, for a Ford, right, or Model T or a Mercedes, depending on what you know, country you were operating in. But there were other ones that phased out of that. If, if you look at the evolution of any type of a, of a product or a process or, or a manufacturing environment, I think the key nuance is recognizing that, recognizing it that it's going to happen, and starting down the path as opposed to putting the blinders on, ignoring it, and then just you know, wondering why your orders dried up in, in two, five, ten months or years. So tell me some of the technologies. Like I think you were, you were mentioning how sensors are being used on manufacturing equipment. What, what are you seeing out there? Hmm. There's, I think there's, there's a lot of interesting uh, things going on in just the sensor realm in general, and I'll try and stay agnostic. Um, I think fundamentally, from a cybersecurity standpoint, there, there's there's been a lot of conversation that I've heard recently, recently being the past you know three to six months around, you know the concept of cybersecurity. Everyone focuses on the the ensuring the data packet, whatever that data happens to be, is is secure. You know the analogy I always use is the you know, like a football analogy for the, for the sports heads out there. So yeah. You know, you're on the one yard line and you got 99 yards to go downfield to, to score. So, you know, the quarterback snaps the ball, gives it to his running back, and the guy takes off hell bent across the, uh, the greens. He gets all the way down, runs across the, uh, the goal line, looks down, and he's carrying a lampshade. <laughs> so, so, what I mean by that is, you know, if, if you have a, a secure and a robust you know, cyber program to ensure the, the authenticity of that data packet, Make sure whatever data packet they're carrying is the right one. And there's, as I mentioned a second ago, I, I think there's sensors are generating that data. If it's an analog, it's going to be converted to digital. So that packet is what's being secured and taken down, you know, across the field, my analogy. I think there's an opportunity, though, to take a look at what are we doing at that, that fundamental sensor level? Or how are we cross-checking the data that's being generated by that sensor? And I can cite a couple examples where they've had, you know, failures and even catastrophic failures in the field that were not malicious in intent, but it was because the process, uh, something in the process broke down, or more specifically, the capital equipment broke down, uh, and the process did what it was supposed to, but it was getting bad data. Mm-hmm. So, so that's that's one piece. Um, and the example that, that I'm referring to is it was a dam, and I'm trying to recall the, the country that it was in power generation uh, water dam and the uh, the sensor array for the level sensing on the dam fell off and when it fell off you know it, whether it pitched out at an angle it was giving a reading that the water level in the reservoir was low 
So process engineering control loop said, turn on the pumps. So it turned on the pumps. Oh dear. And it filled the reservoir up. Well, and then the dam had a catastrophic failure, right? It flooded, it broke. So there, it, it's not the process that was at fault. It was simply something that atrophied and, you know, fell down or, or whatever it was that got, you know, misoriented. But the point is, if you don't have that fundamental cross check to say, hey, sensor A is giving me a reading, but that doesn't really make sense based off of everything else. Hmm, maybe we should go walk out there and take a look at it. So in, in the spirit of you know, artificial intelligence in a world of uh, you know, cyberdyne systems that are forthcoming, I think there's, there's still a place for good old fashioned uh, human inspection and, and uh, a little bit of logic to, to play. Now that's just one example, or so one area I think. There's another one that I, I can give you as well. Uh, I know there's a tremendous amount of work going on in energy storage not just in sensors, but just globally, right? You've got electric vehicles, you have um, you know, drone technology, you have um, arguably the same type of technology coming into a home where you're, you're looking at uh, you know, power storage, whether it's for a vehicle or otherwise, even using the vehicle. So there's a lot of work being done there uh, in terms of maximizing or maybe looking for that next step change in, in technology that, that's gonna get us across home plate. That matriculates into um, alternative forms of energy too, you know, solar, wind, you need a way to capture that and store that energy, especially on, on something where it's intermittent like wind. Right. But and, sh and share it, it if, if you need to, because you don't have the capacity to store it, right? Yeah, but, absolutely. Absolutely. So on yeah. the sensor level, Jan, I mean, you think, you know, a lot of these sensors, if you're in a remote location, you know, they need power. Mm -hmm. Well, Okay, well, then they're going to utilize a battery. Well, so I think there's any breakthrough you see in energy storage there. Uh, there's a couple of organizations, or at least one that I can think of now, that is, is making battery, batteryless sensors. So they're self powering sensors depending on the application. So they've got harvesting technology where they're pulling that energy out of, um, out of the environment that they're operating in. So I think there's, there's a lot of exciting breakthroughs that are coming down the line now with, with that type of technology and organizations where you're going to see things pop up that are going to really resonate in the industry. You, um, you had an interesting tweet just the other day, and this is completely away from manufacturing, and it's more about the healthcare side of it, but it was um, a small piece of technology for the diabetes industry, some pill that people would swallow, it would sit in their stomach and release insulin. Tell me about that, because I yeah. thought that was fascinating. <laughs> well, it was... <laughs> That Sorry, was one, it's one of those tempest in a teapot ones, right? I, I'm chronically looking for something that's going to resonate with, uh, with folks. And as you can imagine, you know, the spidey sense on something like that on a personal level for myself, I look at it and I say, wow, that's pretty exciting. I think, wow, that's pretty scary too. <laughs> yeah. But my understanding of it, obviously I'm not an expert on this, is something that I just, I found as well. But it's a pill and it has some type of insulin storage in it. But when you ingest it, it somehow nest in the digestive tract when I think they sort of somewhere in the stomach area and it locates you know whether it's an artery or a capillary or something so that it's like a little mini storage device and delivery device that's now inside your body and somehow it just it plugs in and it, it's able to inject insulin when you need it hmm. so for folks that are suffering from you know whatever type of diabetes whether it's type 1 type 2 it sounds like a very interesting breakthrough I think there's probably some challenges with that, um, like anything else, you know, from a, maybe a public perception standpoint, is it safe, has it been tested? Uh, but those types of, you know, cutting edge technology, somebody's gotta, as they say, damn the torpedoes and just say, look, I think there's a better way to do this. Mm -hmm. And it's always interesting to me when you see something like that, that when, it, when it pops out. Well, and that takes me back to your, your story about the dam. And it makes me think of people who have, I don't know, pacemakers or whatever piece of electronic in their body that's supposed to tell that something's supposed to tell that electronic device to do what it's supposed to do. But if it if the data is suddenly wrong, <laughs> like whoops, you've got some problems. Like all of a sudden, if the, that pill is firing out a whole bunch of insulin and it's not supposed to, or your pacemaker decides it's got to get your heart beating a lot faster because the data gets bad, then you have a real problem. Oh, yeah. There's, there's a, a laundry list of things that start to come to mind, right? Like, holy cow. Yeah. That, that would be bad, very bad. And when you're dealing with health, right, or anything 
mm-hmm. little stuff that you're ingesting or that's directly tied into your a vital organ, right? I mean, that that's huge. That's it's about as big as you can get of what's the downside of, of a failure, right? Or even a, a partial failure. It's, it can be life-threatening. Yeah. You know, similarly, you start to think about, well, what about things that aren't necessarily a hack? Well, what about EMF, you know, interference? Yeah. You know, once again, you know, they say, don't, you can't go on this ride or don't walk through this scanner if you have a pacemaker, right? Well, then that device has obviously been tested, but what if they don't test it correctly? Or, or what if they didn't think to test it against the garage door opener frequency? You know, that's, that's, that's in this day and age, that's part of the routine, but, but you get my point, right? Well, what about yeah. 5G? What about something else where, you know, it's not part of the standard or it hasn't been incorporated yet, but it's, it's an area where technology is outpacing, you know, the standards, the regulation, and those types of aspects. If, if you're that manufacturer, you've got to be thinking about those things. The last thing you want is, you know, to come out with a breakthrough that, uh, you know, may improve someone's lifestyle exponentially, but, you know, decreases it you know, to the ultimate level because of the unintended consequence of walking through a uh, you know metal detector at a concert or, or something along those lines so there's always a never-ending basket of things to consider and, and work around it and challenges to overcome for you know the folks the scientists and engineers that are designing new products well and i think by nature you know people people tend to be fearful and it has been said that cyber is the new domain of warfare so the minute you hear of something going wrong say the dam situation you go oh is that a cyber attack or you know and it's no it was a the data was wrong but i mean people have fears about the unknown and right now there's a lot of things that are happening and transpiring that make people just a little bit uncomfortable because they just don't completely understand it. But this is the world that we're moving forward in. And I guess um, getting people to understand the technology and trust the technology is uh, really where we have to go. And people are going to have to be checking their data and making sure that things are operating correctly. So the human being is still going to be necessary in the whole process. I, I fundamentally think they are. I mean, it's at least for now, right? I can be proven <laughs> wrong, but I think, uh, you know, we're, we're not quite there yet. You know, there's, there's a tremendous amount of advancement in artificial intelligence, but it's, it, you're not substituting the human mind yet. Yeah, maybe that day will come, and then if it, maybe it'll come sooner than, than uh, folks think. Uh, but to your point, there's, I don't know what that, when that time is, but I think there's a certain point in someone's lifespan where they, they, they fall off the wagon, so to speak. And I'm not talking about a consumption standpoint, but from an, an embracing technology, I mean, you grew up in the, the 70s, 80s, 90s, wherever your decade was, you were know, mm-hmm. a video gamer. Well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a Generation Xer, so I, I play games and I look at the games that my son plays and I'm, I just, I'm like, wow. <laughs> I'm like, not, not lost, but just, you know, to the point your comment around technology is just like, you know, I mean, yet it's fundamental. It's almost, almost hardwired to them. You know, they just, they get it. Yeah. Or you see a baby in the mall and they're trying to, to scroll across the TV screen with their finger. And it's not <laughs> doing anything. And they have this puzzled look on their face. Like, what? I can't turn the page. What's going on? Yeah. Um, Cause it's all that they've ever known. Right. You know, the kids that are, you know, in grade school and today and, and grammar school, you know, they, they don't know what a CD is. You know, let alone a, a, a tape, an eight-track, or a, uh, they could care less whether it was a beta or a, a VHS, right? What is that? It's something that belongs in a museum. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's probably a good thing they never have to know about an eight-track. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> nobody ever wanted to know about those in the first place. You know, Greg, yeah. I, I've had a, this has been a really interesting conversation. There's so many other areas I'd like to go, but as, um, Chief Innovation Officer, I hope I have the chance to talk to you again, but one final question, you know, I don't think that you could be the Chief Innovation Officer for a publication like IIoT World if you didn't have a really positive and um, hopeful look at the future with all this technology. So um, is there one thing out there that you are really looking forward to in the near or, or distant future from technology? Oh, wow. Um... You know, to, to pin it down to one thing, Janet, um, I don't know. I, I don't know that there's one particular aspect. I, I think the one at the moment that just happens to resonate with me, I think, is augmented reality. I think there's a, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for that technology. The world was excited about virtual reality that was coming out. 
uh, and it, it's delivered a lot of value. But when you look at augmented, I mean, you're, you're incorporating the living world with, uh, or your visual world, the world you're living in right now, with uh, the capability to overlay, uh, could be, you know, blueprints, it could be, uh, you know, pipelines, you know, for in, invasive checking, you know, think before you dig, those types of things from a business standpoint. Uh, mm -hmm. A friend of mine is doing a beta, beta test right now on an augmented reality system that, uh, you know, and they, of course, they've got the games on it, right? The gaming industry always seems to be, uh, you know, right on the bleeding edge of things. And, you know, he's, he's describing these games to me, and, you know, you're sitting in it, it does a laser scan of your entire room that you're in and that incorporates it into the game. You know, you turn around and there's a gremlin wow. falling out of your couch. You know? Wow. <laughs> so <it's> just, wow. <laughs> great. The things nightmares are made from, right? But, the, <laughs> but brilliant technology, to say the least. So I'll give that some thought, though, and when we perhaps our paths cross next, I'll, uh, I'll have some more exciting things to talk to you about. Yeah. Okay, great. Greg, I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much for, for taking the time to chat with me. Oh, my pleasure. Take care, Janet. <laughs> Greg Orloff is the Chief Innovation Officer at IIoT World. They are the first global digital publication dedicated 100% to connected industry, industrial internet of things, and industry 4.0. And uh, you should check out his Twitter feed. He's always showing some really fantastic stuff. That is our show for this week. Thanks very much for listening to the Make It Right podcast. And if you enjoyed what you heard, please share it with your friends.